and welcome to Behind the Mask. I'm Ray Flynn, and tonight we've got a really, really great guest, Brian Free. Brian, it's wonderful to have you here with Thank us. Thank you, Ray. It's great to be here. So um, when I think about Brian Free, I have to think about uh, the most awarded tenor in all of gospel music. I think about you being with Gold City. I think about you with a quartet at one time. I think about you as a soloist at one time. Uh, you've been... Uh, I've covered the gambit. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, let's go back. Let's go back in time for just a little bit and let's sure. go to the beginning. Where did you start? How did you start in this? Well, in this, uh, Gold City was my first. Uh, oh, my, really? my first group. Yeah, now I, I traveled on a local level there, close to where I live for many, many years. Started with my family when I was six. Um, my family traveled and I played the drums and sang. We, we started off in our home church and then kind of veered out from there and traveled around uh, mostly just Alabama, Georgia, and Tennessee, and a few just the southern, southeastern states for a number of years. And then in my teenage years, I sang with a couple of different groups there in the Atlanta area uh, for the next number of years. And then as soon as I graduated high school, I uh, was not quite sure what I was going to do. and. I went to work at the Coca-Cola Company plant in Marietta driving a forklift, loading trucks. <laughs> yeah, I was trying, I, did, I had a clue what I was going to do. And I got home from work one day and Floyd Beck, the owner, founder uh, of Gold City, had placed a phone call and heard me with one of those local groups. And they were looking for a tenor singer. and. I went up there, audition in Dahlonega. He offered me the job and took it, and that's when it started, and that's been almost four years ago. Wow. That, that started. That, that's, that's unbelievable. So, Once Upon a Hill, when, wh what year was that? Do you remember? That would be 86. That was on the Portrait album. 80, I believe it was 86. So that was the first time that I remember seeing Gold City, was during that period of time. Yeah. And it was amazing because at that time, gospel music was headed in a direction that I, I really liked the music at that point. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was, it was a, a mix of traditional gospel, but there was some worship and things in there that had strong lyrics. Yeah. And uh, it was a blessing yeah, to I me. Agree. So, how, so how many years were you there with them? Almost 13. 13 yeah, years. Almost 13 years. And it, talking about what you're, what you're referring to, during the early mid 80s is when things lyrically with a, with a few groups started changing things yeah. that's, that's when things started turning turning not against the traditional not away from the traditional but it become it become more it become more about the song and the ministry than it was just the entertainment yeah uh, and having fun and there's nothing wrong with good christian entertainment and have right. fun you know you want people to enjoy it when they come um, but it it become very much song centered to me, at least to do the ministries that I've been a part of. Well, watching you for the last 30 years, 30 years, um, you think about it, and you've always been a person who has kept ministry out front. To me, that's important. To me, that's why you do Christian music. Yeah. And as a Christian, that's our music. And if you're not going to focus on the ministry side of it and what it can do, for our own lives as well as the people you sing to then do something else you can make a whole lot more money doing some other type of music than you That's can in, uh, in, in what we do so it has to be to me what we do should just be an extension of the church it should be we're missionaries we just out of the church is what we should be doing is just coming out of our own home, home churches not leaving them but being a, a satellite uh, ministry outside of our home church and if you're not going to minister through through the word which is what gospel music is, then do something else. Well, I know whenever you announced that you were going to be leaving Gold City, um, a lot of people were questioning, why in the world, <laughs> whenever you are <laughs> such a popular, popular tenor with Gold City, right there at the very peak of their popularity, and you decide that you're going to leave. So, so what, what was your what was your thought? There? Actually, I heard a few comments of you lost your mind. You're crazy. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm one of those. I believe in in the go out on top. I mean, don't wait. Don't wait till you're on your way out, uh, and 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 try to salvage something. And you're you're taking a bucket and pulling water out of the boat before it sinks. 
I believe I, I was I, I really I really felt like God was through with me there. Uh, just just him impressing upon my heart. Nothing against anyone. Not anything negative. Not that I was ready to get away. I was ready to get away, but it was because of the unrest that God had placed in my heart to do something else. At the first part of it, I had no clue what He wanted me to do. And until I, my wife and I prayed about it, talked about it, until I took that first step, it's like being in a dark room and, and, and God was waiting. You know, you, I'm not going to turn the light on until you take that first step. And He's done that many times in my life. And that was one of those cases. And as soon as I took that first step, it all came pretty clear. Mm. So when you left Gold City, did you immediately form another group? I did. Actually, I formed Brian Free Insurance, BFA, the last year that I was with Gold City. Um, so a lot of people don't, may not know the history. I mean, I care about the history <laughs> of Gold City. But uh, myself, uh, Tim Riley, Gary Jones, and Ivan Parker owned Gold City, 25% apiece. We were equal partners. We all had our own jobs. Um, um, and we, the year that I left, I went to the guys in January or February. And I said, guys, I'm, I'm leaving. And um, I don't know how long this is going to take, um, but I'm, I'm at least stay till the end of the year. So during that year, I formed the group and I hired Mike Lefebvre, who was uh, the baritone singer for us with Gold City for a number of years. He had already left at that point. So I hired him, uh, hired a guy from Texas, uh, uh, Kevin Price, who was a music minister to church out there. Hired him and we started the trio. You know, BFA. So we started off trio, and we ended, we've ended up trio. Um, but we started that, and we recorded in the summer, May, April, May, uh, late spring, early summer of that year, and had our CD ready to come out. Oh, like back back then, cassette and CD uh, had that ready. wasn't eight track or LP, but we had uh, had that ready to come out as soon as we started. So my last date with Gold City was December thirty first at Batwell Auditorium in Birmingham, Birmingham, Alabama. And that was, it was December 31st was the last night that I stepped on stage of Gold City. And then the very following weekend was our first weekend on the road as BFA of wow. 94. Wow. So you also, you were a solos for a period of time, right? I did. I, 98 and 99, I uh, went solo. I was ordained as a minister back in 2000. And when the whole process first started, it was very hard for me to, to figure out how I was going to do it because uh, the studies and going through the MIP is is a, a time-consuming, very time-consuming thing, and most of you have to be present for. So I knew that my schedule would not allow yeah. for me to do both at the same schedule that we were traveling 220 days a year before. So I, I thought, well, if I go solo, um, I can do fewer dates because you know I, it didn't take a rocket science to scientist to figure it out. You're if your if your outgo is lower and your income can be lower, so you don't you can survive on less. So we did that and for for the two years, and then I started the group back right after the ordination took place in, in two thousand. So as far as preaching and stuff, did you do very much preaching? You know what? I have been asked to preach a number of times. I've done it twice, mm -hmm. and walked away the second time saying, God, unless you in an audible voice tell me that I am to preach again or pastor a church, I won't do it. Yeah. Not everyone's called to preach. Right. I'm not a preacher. You're called to minister. Yeah, I'm called to minister, but in the way that God is giving me the ability to do it. And that's, it, it, it's it, preaching, pastoring, especially pastoring is a calling yeah. that, buddy, if you tackle that on, if you're self-called, you're in trouble. Oh, so yeah. I found out early on that I was not a preacher. Yeah. Uh, I respect what they do, admire what they do. When it's done well, uh, there's nothing better, but I, it's not me. God yeah. has called me to do this in the way that, that I, when I do this from stage. Wow. So the BBC, the BBC had you come and you did some kind of thing uh, as a tribute to Elvis Presley. Yes. Actually, we were contacted by BBC America. Of, they were doing a documentary film. I forgot what anniversary it was of something of, of Elvis and one of his gospel albums. And they they did it at Sun Studio in Memphis, downtown Memphis, the famous studio where Elvis started. And they invited one Christian artist, one uh, person from our area, and that was us, which kind of blew my mind to begin wow. with. Wow. And they invited us. And of course, when the lady contacted me, I loved her accent, I'm um, But when she contacted me and asked if we would be interested, I, of course, I jumped on it. Yeah. We went into the studio that day and there was, everyone there. I'm talking some big famous uh, 
uh, rock and, and country and jazz and, and black gospel artists. There were all kinds of artists there. And uh, we were, uh, we were, uh, we weren't in Kansas anymore. It was pretty <laughs> obvious. But we went in and we did Peace in the Valley, a cappella, there in the middle of that studio, which was really neat. It was neat to be in the studio. Yeah. That, that, that's a very famous place. A lot of artists mm-hmm. got their start there. So it was neat to be there. It was neat to be a part of it. And it was a privilege that they had asked us. And we've gotten, Lord, emails and Facebook messages over the years from all over the world from people who didn't know we existed until they saw that. And, and, and picked up some, some friends and fans across around the world. Hmm. So being there with secular artists, did you feel welcome there being the only gospel artist? You know what? It, we, I kind of at first thought, uh, Lord, do you want us here in this atmosphere? Hmm. And I, I really, I did really pray about it. I didn't give her the answer immediately. I said, let me, let me look at our schedule, see if we can do it. I don't see any reason why not. But in turn, I was really just kind of putting her off for a little while right? Uh, until I thought about it. I knew that once we got there, we would not be in our element, as you want to call it. But I also know that if we just carry the gospel in our element, yeah. we're not going to reach people who are lost. Yeah. And I didn't, I didn't, and there again, I didn't have in the back of my mind, oh, we're going to go in there and get everybody saved. It wasn't that. Right. I just knew that you we went in as a representative. Yes, we just went in there to represent our industry, yeah. our music, and there was it was like again a different atmosphere. I mean, I don't kid you. It, you know, we go backstage at gospel concerts. There's um, there's snacks, you know, and chips and right. and Sprite and Coke. It wasn't that way there. Right. Um, it was just a little different atmosphere. But uh, we went in there. They treated us very well, very respectful. Not not one artist there was rude or demeaning or anything it was, it was really a great atmosphere and we, we made some friends that's good while we we're there so well, it was I'm, it was a good experience i'm sure that you you went in and shined the light in the darkness and we so did we did our best we, i just told the guys for everyone to go in there and do what we do be yourself don't change don't change the way you talk deliver anything don't hold back if you get the, uh, get the opportunity to talk about the lord talk about the lord and we actually did wow we actually did get the, a couple of opportunities that's incredible so I know you just recently had a birthday, <laughs> and yet you still have... You had to bring that up. <laughs> no, you still have a very young complexion. Uh, God's really blessed you with great skin and all that kind <laughs> of sweet. stuff. You know, uh, but, uh, the mirror tells me different, but thank you. <laughs> but the thing about it is, is that you also gained the nickname of Precious. <laughs> And how in the world did you get, as a man, to get the name Precious? How did that come That about? happened years and years and years ago. Back in the earlier, I want to say it was probably around 82 or 83, uh, we as Gold City, we were somewhere in Pennsylvania. And I want to say it was uh, Kempton, Pennsylvania. It used to be a big sing out there, and we do it every year. We had sung, come to the table, and we were all behind the table. And... A lady, a sweet little old lady, and she had to be, um, she had to be in her early mid eighties. Come to the table, she just reached, didn't say anything else, other than reached across the table, grabbed me by my cheek, pulled me as I mean halfway over the table, and she said, "You're so precious." And the way she did it was so sweet. Mm. And uh, the guys heard her, and Jerry Ritchie, our manager and MC at that time, the very next weekend, mentioned it from stage when he introduced me, and it snowballed from here, stuck. Yeah. And after that, it was like, Lord, I mean, there were a lot of people who didn't even know my first name. They just called me Precious. <laughs> so then that happened for a long time. So the song, um, Looking for a City. Yes. It's one of those kind of songs that I know that people request all the time, and you probably are sick of singing. <laughs> <laughs> well, you got to be careful. I don't, don't want to say I'm sick of singing it. Um, we still do it every once in a while. But, it, <laughs> every, but, but what it is... It's one, of those, it's one of those songs, number one, I, I, I'd rather do a song that that has more meat to it. Yeah, yeah. You know, that, that I mean, I don't know that anybody ever, they may, may have, if anybody ever got <laughs> saved after hearing Looking for a City, but, and I'm sure it may have happened, you know, I pray it has. And also, the, the older I get, it's not as easy for me to do as it right. was 40 years ago. Yeah. Uh, I mean, anybody to tell you the older you get, you know, the more difficult it becomes. And as a first tenor, I mean, I've already outlived my career, thank you, Jesus, 
uh, as far as singing tenor by many, many years compared to most. And, and it's, so it's, it's, it's work. Yeah. It's not as easy as it used to be. So I don't, I don't do it as often as, I don't do it as often as it gets requested. <laughs> well, you talked about your music and your music has changed. Mm -hmm. uh, it's changed through the years. And I look at where Brian Free Insurance is today and I listen to that music, and you're talking about being music that ministers and has a message. Uh, there's very few groups out there that has as strong a music as what you have right now. Thank you, Ryan. That, yeah. that means more to me than anything. Because that's, that's the only thing, in my opinion, that's going to that's gonna stick with us. It's going to change our life. It's going to minister to us. Get us through things. Yeah. Is, is God's Word without any compromise. I know that uh, we were in Gatlinburg, Tennessee, and I don't remember what was going on, but you know, I normally try to stay right there near the stage. Mm -hmm. And I like, I am, a, I'm a Jesus fan. I'm a, I am a worshiper mm -hmm. whenever, when God is in there and God's being honored, I like to be right in the middle of it. Amen. And that night, for some reason, I got pulled out. Something was going on, they needed my attention. And I walked back in, and y'all were singing, amen. Say amen. Mm -hmm. And I stood there at the side of the stage, and the presence of God was just so strong, so strong. And it began to minister to me. And I mean, I was at a point where I needed that. I needed that. Yeah. And I appreciate the fact that you have continued to try to focus on bringing songs um, to the audience that touches them. That it's not, I mean, there are songs that are entertaining, but there are songs that just reach in, minister to your heart. Yep. And so I appreciate that. Thank you, you Ray. I, I just, that's one of those things that when we pick songs for a CD, I, I, I want all, if it's an EP, the five songs or six songs, or if it's a full 10 song project, I don't, I don't pick filler songs. Yeah. I'll spend a year, year and a half sometimes picking those songs before the project ever takes place because I want them to be, each one of them has to count yeah. for something. And, I, and, and I'm the same way. These songs, look, these songs, I pick them if they minister to me. And I'm listening to when a writer sends me something, if it doesn't minister to me and hit me, we're not cutting it. Yeah. And then again, if, I, if it's something I don't feel like we as an artist, because some songs are not meant for every artist, if we can't convey that song and serve the people with that song, and that's what we're doing. When we stand on stage and we sing a song, we're serving. I, I mean, that's the only way I know how to explain it. We are feeding, serving the Word of God. And if I can't do that, or one of my guys can't do that uh, in an effective way, then we're not gonna do that song. Somebody else needs to do it that can serve it. Yeah. Well, we talked a little bit about uh, the precious thing and the fact of you still having the young looking face and everything, but you went through a hard time not too long ago. You got some bad news medically. Well, uh, um, November of 18, through a routine physical, and I'll try to condense this, got diagnosed, or they thought, was, was something called ITP. And it's, uh, they found it through a blood test. Uh, just, it, it, what it means is they know what causes it, and there's no cure for it. Um, and it's a rare uh, immune disorder. And your body attacks the platelets in your blood, which makes your blood coagulate and determines the thickness of your blood, the body is, for some reason, is attacking them and destroying them as fast as your body makes them. Uh, where a normal person will hover around 350,000 or 400,000 is the number count. Mine were at 7,000, which I had no idea. I had no symptoms uh, that I could feel. I didn't know anything was wrong, but had I gotten cut or been in a car accident or something, I would have bled to death before I could ever got me anywhere. So it was very scary. And then, but when I first, the, to go back, the my, when my doctor called me, uh, I knew it was spooky. You know, you know how that is. When the doctor himself calls you, when you know, after hours or shortly after you've left, you know something's not right. Right. And he said, "I want you to go see an oncologist tomorrow." Well, right. that automatically, you know, you start. <laughs> you, you've been there. Oh yeah. So you know what you're thinking. And I went, and the he just my, that doctor looked at my wife and I, and I'll never. We were talking about this before. Uh, my wife and I, I'll never forget her face or my face or how I felt and how the air got sucked out of that room when he looked at us and said, uh, you have, is there 90% chance or better that you have either leukemia or multiple myeloma? And both, you know, most terminal cancers in most people. 
he said the only way we'll know for sure is to do a bone marrow biopsy, and which anyone who's been through that, you know, yeah. that's very brutal. Yeah. And, and, and it's, it's, they sent it off to Mayo Clinic and local clinic. Thank God, when it came back, it was not cancer. But that was the longest five, six days of my life. Uh, I don't care who you are, how strong a Christian you are, I don't believe there's anyone walking the face of this, this earth, if they'll be honest with everyone else and themselves, can say that a million things don't go through your mind. Yeah. I mean, I, I was already making my plans. Yeah. You know, and Pam and I slept, we slept very little. Yeah. There were nights we just lay there in the bed, just stare at the ceiling, and, you know, it may go 40 minutes in silence and then say something, you know. And she just reached over and touch my leg or, you know, hug me or something, you know, and say, we're going to get through this. So we went through that. The, the test came back. When they came back negative, of course, we celebrated. Um, but in saying that, I know that many people don't have a test come back that way. That's right. That's right. You know, you know. Yeah. And so that, for that, you know, I thank God that it happened that way. But, I, you know, I, I feel for anyone who didn't get that same response. So anyway, uh, they threw medicine at it. Uh, so there's no cure for this, but we, we found in some cases we throw medicine at it. They threw heavy doses of, of prednisone and dexamethasone and all this stuff, uh, like 150, 200 milligrams a day, which is unbelievable. Wow. Turns you into a monster. You don't sleep. You eat everything in sight. Uh, you're ill all the time. You're on edge. Yeah. Um, I slept about two to three hours a night uh, on average if I could get that. It, it went three months that way. It didn't work. It increased the numbers a little bit, but it didn't work. But what it did do was destroy my hips. It gave me what's called avas avascular necrosis, which blood stops flowing to your joints. Okay, so it killed both of my hips, and I started you having like from bad to worse. Oh, bad I, to worse. I, I, I couldn't couldn't walk, and I didn't know what was going on. At first, they thought I just pulled muscles uh, working in the yards like that. Anyway, after the CT scan, it showed that both hips were completely gone. So I had double hip replacement. Uh, and then they said, well, the last resort on the ITP is to remove your spleen. Sometimes we found in eight out of 10 cases, if we take your spleen out, for whatever reason, in your immune system, it stops ITP. They did that, it didn't work. Wow. So I had to take a perfectly good spleen and that didn't work. And what that did do is compromise my immune system. So now for the rest of, of my life, unless God just chooses to, to heal, um, which if he does, I'm ready for it. If he does, I'm ready for it either way. I have to be careful. It's yeah. like someone who's gone through 20, 30 chemo treatments, the way it weakens your body. Right. So I have to be careful. But that, that's, that, I say all that to say this, through every step of it, God has been there. Through every step of it, God will be there. Uh, the little setbacks, have, my setbacks are nothing compared to, to many people. So I, I, I don't talk about it a whole lot from stage. When I was actually going through it, I had to explain some reasons why I wasn't there, right. or I had to go straight to the bus, or I had to sit on a stool, or I couldn't walk, those things. But it's, it's best behind me, and, and, and God's taking care of, of myself and my family in, in every way. So I want you to think, during that period of time, when you were at your worst and you were fighting that, did you see yourself at some point saying, I'm not going to be able to continue touring, singing? Oh, yeah. Yeah, during that, uh, only during that five or six days, Honestly, when, when I thought it was that, I was like, okay, well, how are we going to, how am I going to shut this down um, and still be able to take care of my family? You, know, you start thinking of all kinds of things. What are the medical expenses going to be? How, you know, even with insurance, how are things going to go with, with, with cancer? What, what's what's going to happen? Yeah. Uh, all these things. You know, and you start thinking about not seeing, I've got two grandsons, Pam and I do, and I, you start thinking, I'm not going to get to see my grandboys grow up. Or, you know, I'm not going to see my youngest son get married and have children. I'm not going to see those grandchildren. You just start a million things go through your mind, you know. Yeah. And, uh, and so that being said, it was, uh, I was not ready to shut it down by any means. I was like, well, God, ever how long you allow me to be out there on stage uh, and be able to do this, I'll do it. Yeah. And, you know, until I become, I become too weak to where I can't. Right. I'll do it until I, until I can't. That's what I love. That's amazing. Well, I know that... Um, we did a tour together called Beyond Amazing that actually came from uh, one of the songs off of your project. Yep. And that was during that time that you were fighting all of this. Yeah. And whenever I look back, you know, I was thinking about doing another tour and I was praying about who to use on that tour. Mm -hmm. And watching what God did on that tour, it was like God knew not only did we need you on that tour, I needed it. 
you needed to be on there. Every night during that tour, every single night, it helped me more than anything or anyone could have helped to sit there <clears throat> on that stage with that group of artists and those preachers and you and watching and listening and being fed. Um, God knew I needed to be there at that time. Yeah. And, and there was not a night. By the time we were always last and by the time I got on stage, I had cried so much and shouted so much, I didn't have much of a voice left to sing. <laughs> I did the best I could, but I, you know what? I didn't care. Yeah. I wasn't about to hold back what the Holy Spirit was doing. I remember um, when we first started that tour, we did a live video. Yeah. And um, Scott Godsey, who was with Daywin at that time, mm -hmm. um, you know, Scott had told us all, you know, it's a live video, you know, um, try to, you know, don't get up during the video, don't cough, try not <laughs> to pick your nose, and all, all those kind of things. Yeah, yeah. And, People are watching. But in the midst of that, in a live video shoot, God began to move in such an incredible way that it broke all of us. Yeah. All yeah. Of us. I'll be honest with you. I've never been a part of a tour like that. I've done a lot of tours in my nearly 40 years out here. Yeah. And I have never been a part of anything like that. Yeah. The, the Holy Spirit, it was so strong, so thick in those meetings. And it wasn't anything that we brought in. Yeah. It was us coming in with the worship frame of mind, wanting, I forgot there were cameras out there. Oh yeah. I, I'll be honest with you, when I get to worshiping, I, I don't mean this to sound the wrong way, but I don't think about people, I don't think about cameras, I don't think about where we are. None of that stuff really plays a part anymore. I don't care. I, I want to be fed, I want to be ministered to, I want to leave that stage in, in a better way than I come on this stage. And, and if I'm going to do that, I'm going to have to focus on what's important. Yeah. And yeah, it's like I said, the cameras, <laughs> I'm sure they captured some stuff if you saw all the footage, but man, I, I just, I, I forgot all about it. I forgot all, but I was so engrossed in, in the music and in the worship and the words of the preaching. It was just, it was awesome. I think there were times that we all became just broken. That yeah, night. yeah. Broken. And, and, and like you said, I went into that whole situation. That's when I was going through all those battles and, and Satan was doing everything he could do to to beat me down and my family down, and um, and it was so much, so many things, and I was in pain a lot of it. Yeah. Um, uh, a lot of it was on crazy medicine too. So, as much as I'm trying to focus, I don't know if anybody's ever been on that much of that uh, prednisone or stuff, but you, it's hard to focus when you're taking <laughs> that kind of stuff. I mean, it's really hard to focus. So I was. That's when I knew where well, the Holy Spirit took over. None of that played a part. It was gone. It was like the Lord just cleaned it all out. It was. It, I was so engrossed in that. I'll never forget that tour. I'll never as long as I live. Uh, I know that you know Scott. Scott Godsey. He's an incredible producer. Absolutely. And he had told us that night that we'll probably have to stop a few times. He said it, during any video, <laughs> there's always little hiccups and you have to stop. We didn't stop once. No. Uh, God's no. presence flooded that place, and then. We had decided that we were going to leave full message, invitation, whole nine yards in it. Yep. And that video captured people all over that building coming to Christ. Absolutely. It's, it was a God thing. That whole, the whole tour, your idea, the whole thing, everything, the artists you put together, the preachers put together, the way it was done, the way it was structured, that was a God thing. It was so well orchestrated by God, and it was, it was evident. When we were on the cruise and we did the very last one on the oh, cruise. Wow. <laughs> Tell wow. people about that. I just want you to know that this old church of God boy could have run off the balcony of that cruise in the water. <laughs> um, it was it was that same that just shows me it didn't matter where we were. Mm -mm. We could have been in a barn somewhere, middle yeah. of a field. It didn't matter where we were. Yeah. I mean we joined together spiritually and physically to have one goal to have one goal and we all had the same goal and that's why things went that's why God honored it I believe that in the cruise wow yeah I mean that was again I, by the end of those nights I was exhausted yeah. I mean I had been so emotional and the Holy Spirit had done so much and the singing was so great and I worshiped so much 
I mean, I was spent. I mean, I don't think I ever slept any better than I slept the <laughs> nights after those dates. <laughs> oh, my goodness. So what's next for Bride Free Insurance? Well, we, uh, we are in the middle of a brand new project that will be coming out in probably May, maybe June, uh, a new six-song EP uh, with our new baritone. We have a new baritone singer named Jake Anglin. Jake is a great singer, great guy. Um, I've met a lot of people, and in the almost 28 years I've had this group, you know, I've had a, I've, I've been blessed to not go through a lot of changes. Bill Shivers, my lead singer, has been over 20 years. He's been with me, and my baritones I've only had um, three since I started BFA, and the last two, Mike stayed for eight years, Derek stayed for 10 years prior to that, and then. Uh, uh, Mike before that, Mike LeFevre before that, so we, we've had very little change, thank you Lord, but our new baritone Jake, great guy, ordained minister, preacher, singer, uh, phenomenal singer, just a super nice guy from Georgia, so uh, it's all three Georgia boys now, well it was before with Mike, but uh, that we're finishing up the recording, we started uh, on tracking and we'll be doing the vocals soon, have that out, it's got six great Thank you, God. Songs uh, from from great writers, mm -hmm. and I'm just that's that's the, the first thing. And getting back to to touring uh, is get back on the road. That is uh, very important because I just I've missed it so much. It's just it's what I do. I, I'll probably probably be one of those that like I, I'm one of the old school guys. I'll probably be one of those guys that it, I pass away. It'll be in a bunk. <laughs> you know, but uh, I plan on doing it as long as I can possibly do it. So that's coming up, and then, of course the touring again, and uh, just whatever God's got in store. Yeah. We're just kind of sitting back right now and, and waiting to see how things go. Well, I have no doubt that the new album will be incredible. Uh, all your music uh, has been so good. I, I will tell you this, and we'll tell this to the folks that are watching the program tonight. You know, you have been um, a real inspiration and blessing to me personally, and I count you as a dear brother in Christ. I love your music. I love you and your family. Thank you. The feeling's and, mutual, right? I tell you, you're, there's not there's not enough Brian Freeze out there. Oh, Lord, I don't think the world is standing up <laughs> your kind. Listen, I'd, I'd like to end our, our program tonight with praying for you, Absolutely. if that's okay. That would be great. Let's pray. That would be awesome. Lord, we thank you, God, for your goodness. God, I thank you, Lord, for the way that you've used Brian Free and his ministry through the years. I pray, God, right now that you would put a really large hedge of protection around him. I pray, God, that you would take and touch his body You'd strengthen him and heal him and use him, God, in a mighty way for many years to come. I pray, Lord, that uh, you would take him in ways, God, that would honor you in the best ways. Lord, that you would take him to things beyond his imagination, that you would use him in a way that we would see so many people come to Christ through his ministry. Now strengthen him, use him, God, and bless him and his family for your glory. We ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Brian, I love you, my friend. Love you too, Ray. Thank you so much. Oh, well, thank you all for uh, tuning in tonight to Behind the Mask, and uh, we appreciate you being here. We'll be back again real soon with another great guest.